Uh, hello, I'm Istvan Juhos and I'm a senior Android engineer at Tier. Um, and uh, we will be talking about some octopuses, octopi, today. Actually, just one. No, actually, two. So let's continue. Why octopus? What's octopus in this context? Well, definitely not this. But um, yeah, just a fun fact. Tier is a German company. And um, the, that means that Tier actually means animal. So not the Tier in English, but Tier in German, obviously. So uh, yeah, we tend to name things based on animals. So this is the true octopus that we will be talking about. This is the logo of our design system, which is called Octopus. OK, then. So let's see uh, what Octopus is, actually. So Octopus BC, that is before Compose, uh, is 100% view-based <laughs> design system. OK, I let that sink in. <laughs> So Octopus uh, before Compose was a 100% view-based design system uh, with data binding support and some custom binding adapters, which we don't like, but they were necessary because actually our whole application before not so long ago, before February probably, uh, was based solely on data binding and binding adapters and all of those things and views. Um, but to support the, the application, support every developer in our teams, uh, we created Octopus with very well-defined APIs and also documentation uh, so that even though it's data mining and binding adapters, it's mostly easy to use. And of course, we planned for just view-based UI. So um, yeah, Octopus is purely uh, view-based before Compose. And for that matter, yeah, it's not that fun to maintain. Surprise, surprise. Uh, let's take this uh, small example of a button, our primary button, which you can see all over the application. It, uh, it has quite a few states, but it's actually not that complicated. Uh, for starters, there is this basic state and the loader state when the text is not visible, but the loader is visible instead when something is happening in the background uh, after touching the button. For this to exist, we um, we actually implemented it as a constraint layout, which was a mistake, but let's get over that. Uh, so it's a constraint layout that has a button and a loader on top of it. And this constraint layout is actually controlled from a custom view class, of course. Uh, so that's Kotlin code, and uh, that's in octopus button primary.kt. But uh, the implementation doesn't end there. So for this, we had to implement layout in XML. And as you can see, the naming is already strange because there, there's this underscore underscore internal prefix for every octopus internal thing. And that's because when, uh, when Android does the, uh, the resource merging, then all of your resources get to get smashed together inside this one r.layout class. Um, and yeah, Octopus is actually a, a library, a module, um, actually multiple modules in the application in the main project. So this, uh, so the resources from Octopus are visible from everywhere in the application. This is not nice, obviously. Um, but yeah, we had to just make this uh, this naming scary, like underscore underscore and internal and whatever. And also, of course, this is well documented in the Octopus documentation that no one should use this outside of Octopus. But it's there and it's a possibility, not nice. Also, it's in XML, which is also not nice uh, nowadays. Uh, of course, because we support, we support uh, views with Octopus, there is a styleable, there are attributes that you can use from XML, which should be accessed from, uh, from code, so on and so forth. So that's another XML, and that's another interoperability with XML and code. And also there are drawables, which are, again, exposed to all of the applications. So again, not nice. And we, ha we still have many, many, many XMLs for backgrounds, shapes, uh, ripple colors, and so on and so forth. So obviously, it's not fun to maintain. Another example uh, is uh, something of a hack. Uh, now you see a part of what our Octopus text component can do. Uh, so we can display text in a, a quite a number of ways. But the main thing is that um, we based our Octopus text on text view, which has quite an extensive API, if you recall. It's, uh, couple of thousand lines of code with, with a really, really broad API surface. 
So if we extend this class, then we have a whole lot of APIs that uh, can be called from the clients of DuxView, or in this case, Octopus Text. Um, but uh, yeah, we had a specification. Actually, it's in Figma uh, that, uh, that we based our implementation on. And uh, with this, um, we have, uh, as you can see in the images, we have some specific cases of text that we want to render and how we want to render. So for example, we don't want to enable uh, clients to set the text color because it's set in another way. But the API of TextView is uh, allowing this text color to be visible. And of course, because we're overriding a class uh, and the function in a class, we can change its visibility. So that's where this R setters enabled workaround comes in. So um, as to when we read the attributes from the XML attributes and the style attributes array and so on and so forth, uh, we set this uh, Boolean to true. So that's the internal settings, um, internal settings switch. And when we are done with that, we set that to false. And after that point, if anyone calls these functions like set text color here, it will have no effect, which, uh, which is a bad developer experience. Like you call a function in a class and it doesn't do anything. Of course it's documented, but it's still not nice. Also, we had to struggle with some bugs in the, in the layout editor and the, uh, yeah, the visualizer here, the design editor, because there is a long running bug that uh, the layout uh, Visualizer can't load things from the assets folder, so it doesn't have uh, access to some resources uh, when it renders the UI, like fonts. So we also had to struggle with that uh, and so many things. I don't want to bore. Uh, uh, yeah, don't want to get you bored too much. So let's go into the compose land. We wanted to go. Uh, comp uh, we wanted to adopt compose. Uh, really, really bad because all of the view binding and data binding on top of it and all the binding adapters all over the place uh, weren't uh, really great to us. It uh, made the development more and more clunky over time. So uh, yeah, we wanted to go the Compose way. And uh, the easiest way for us was to just start experimenting with Compose at first. Uh, again, it was around February, January this year that we started to do all of this. So uh, yeah, we started experimenting. We started uh, uh, discovering what we can do. And we identified two ways that we could start. First of all, with Octopus, because we didn't want to put any Compose into production in our uh, not so ready application. So we just uh, wanted to experiment with Octopus. The first approach that we identified is to use our existing views because they are pretty uh, widely used in the application. Of course, most of the screens use Octopus. Uh, some uh, screens use some custom components, but um, yeah, the growing pains. Uh, but yeah, we had all of those views. So we could just use the interoperab interoperability API of uh, Compose and just wrap every view in a Composable, use Android view, and then uh, yeah, just inflate our views or, or just uh, create our views from code. Of course, this is an alternative that we could do. But uh, the first problem when we were experimenting with this, when we were experimenting with this, is that the theme doesn't get translated to Compose right away. So even though we get a context in that factory method, that context doesn't, uh, doesn't have any theme information coming from the outside world. So of course, then we use a context theme wrapper at the explicit theme of theme octopus, which is also defined in XML. So um, yeah. Um, so first thing that we had to do this. And then to set anything up when we are creating that, uh, that view from code, uh, we had to call the explicit API surface of that class which is OK for this Octopus button because it's quite uh, controllable. But if you remember, uh, Octopus text has a whole lot of other problems. Um, so again, the developer experience, the maintainer experience uh, for this wouldn't be much better than what we had before. And of course, we still would have much and much, much XML to maintain. So obviously, this was a no-go at this point. Uh, this solution uh, wouldn't uh, point to the future and better maintainability, of course, which we are striving for. 
So the other approach that we identified is just to re-implement everything. Of course, this uh, might seem like a far-fetched idea, but uh, what we figured out is that we are not running anywhere. We are not in a hurry. We can do it step by step. We can take time. We can um, onboard people to it to uh, do it, uh, to do it because uh, yeah, these experiments were done uh, by like two people, me included. So yeah, we we thought that it would be a nice experiment to do this, and uh, and also it would be a good uh, step forward to better maintainability of Octopus. So this is what we were experimenting with. We took the specification from Figma, and we translated it to this API surface of Octopus Bottom Primary. Uh, it's pretty nice. It looks nice. Everything is there, what can be done with Octopus Bottom Primary. You don't need to go through uh, functions and, and look at what they do. This is pretty straightforward. And also the implementation, we got rid of constraint layout, which is also nice, because in Compose, you actually don't need to use com uh, constraint layout most of the time. You can just use a box and, uh, and columns and rows and every combination of those to achieve pretty much the same result. So yeah, so far so good. This was the way. So uh, what we identified as the benefits for going pure compose is easier maintainability. We write only Kotlin code, no XML involved. Everything, in, everything for a component is at the same place. Also, we could get uh, instant previews if we, if we write previews. That's really nice. We have control over previews. <coughs> That's also nice. So easier maintainability, definitely there. Also, we, we would have no attachment to the legacy view system. We wouldn't have to think uh, for the interoperability things. Uh, that's another plus. And also, uh, Octopus itself is really close to material. I can't show much uh, of it, oh, but actually you already see it in the application, so you can imagine how it looks like. So Octopus is really close to material, and as we've heard in the previous talk, um, Compose already has material things implemented. So uh, we could customize the material stuff. And also, if we implement everything in Compose, we uh, make good examples for, for the rest of our developers to adopt Compose. And uh, of course, if you're doing something in pure Compose, that will be more performant than having views all over the place randomly. OK, of course, for every benefit, there is a downside. Uh, yeah, now we would have a second implementation to maintain. So if everything changes in Figma, then it has to be translated to, either, to, ver, uh, to both views and compose. Uh, of course, we kind of have an idea which one is easier to do. Um, but yeah, at this point, uh, we would have two implementations um, that need parity with, with each other, with the specification, and so on and so forth. And of course, if we deal with Compose, which is a pretty new framework, we have some. We would have to deal some with some experimental APIs, uh, like bottom sheets or or some text stuff. Um, so uh, and of course everything from a component. Um, so yeah, we um, we discussed all, all of this and um, we decided to do it. Uh, so. We are at the point where we decided to go all Compose, re-implement uh, Octopus with Compose. But where, we where do we start? We looked at the documentations that everyone would look at. And uh, there, we identified three possible approaches, again, for, uh, for how should we go forward with this, uh, how, how to do uh, our design system. First, as we already heard from the previous talk, actually, Chaba's already shot all of my gunpowder in this talk, but yeah, I will go forward any, anyway. Um, so yeah, we could customize material, extend material, and go fully custom. Um, but of course, uh, go. F but of course, we chose that because uh, we had some custom uh, custom things in our design system that weren't in material, and and in the end it was easier to just go fully custom than to translate every part of our design system and our own design language into material. 
So of course, by full, going fully custom, we said that, OK, the theme will be fully custom. But whenever we can uh, customize, we, we can easily customize the material components, we will do that just to uh, get some time back from the implementation. So at that point, we started to implement Octopus theme. Octopus theme uh, started out as pretty much the basic theme that you can generate when you create a new project. So it has the easy in dark mode switch, and it uh, it wraps around other, other composable as a content. But here comes the custom stuff. We have all of these things defined in separate objects. We will see how one of those look, uh, which are built from, com uh, which are built from com composable functions. Uh, and um, yeah, the reason for this, why we have those build functions on those classes, is that we in, in the deep, down in the theme, we still load some things from XML because that was an easy way to have parity with the view implementations. OK, so we have all of those objects injected into the theme, uh, having default values, of course. And then we have to provide those, as we've seen in the previous talk again, of course. Uh, so yeah, uh, we'll just have the example of the Octopus Colors class, which we provide as a local colors um, composition local. So we'll focus on this. Of course, in the same file, we have this private local colors composition local of Octopus Colors, which by default doesn't return anything. It just throws an error if it doesn't have a default value. And of course, there is a nice error message so the developers who forget to wrap their composables inside, inside material theme anywhere in their hierarchy, they will see this uh, error message and, um, uh, and the not rendering UI, which is not a great developer experience, but we're working on it. And then we have this helper object called Octopus Theme in the same file. So the composable is called Octopus Theme, and the object is called Octopus Theme, which is completely legal because one is a function, one is a class. And uh, in there, we just um, create this helper of Octopus Theme dot colors, which calls the local colors dot current uh, composition local. So this is how we will uh, how we will uh, access stuff from Octopus theme inside our composables. If you want to get deeper into local com uh, composition locals, then there is the perfect documentation for it. We also went through this to understand how we can add local uh, composition locals into our code and how we can implement Octopus theme with them. So let's take a look at uh, how Octopus colors look, li look like. Um, well, there are other classes involved in creating Octopus colors. These are modeled after uh, our color specification in Figma, uh, which, which translate really, really well into uh, um, class hierarchies. So we could do this. And uh, going a bit deeper into one of those classes that you, you could see uh, before, we have this primary colors uh, class, which have all these colors defined. And finally, in the top level variables, we have those internal colors uh, barely defined as just color variables or constants. OK, how this looks like in, in, uh, in, um, in files. Uh, basic colors has a lot of these color uh, options to choose from, and all of these translate to octopus theme.color.something that we can access from our composables. And also, the whole theme pretty much looks like this. So we, uh, we applied this uh, class modeling for colors, dimensions, fonts, shapes, spacings, uh, and typography as well, which really, really translates well from Figma if there is a well-made specification from the designers. OK, let's look at some components that we implemented. First of all, there is this API guidelines, which everyone should uh, read if you're, um, if you're implementing composables, and also if you're implementing composables for others to use. Um, uh, the, the backbone of this documentation is pretty much uh, do as you see in the foundation library. So yeah, if you do that, then developers who are using your composables 
uh, will be already familiar with uh, with the API they are, they are using, or at least the signature they are using, uh, because they already seen it in the built-in composables, which is a big plus if you want to want people to use your stuff. Okay, so the things that we identified here is. Um, that the APIs we implement with Compose, so pretty much the composables, should reflect the, uh, the, uh, the customization options that are in Figma in our specification. Uh, this was important because, again, going back to the Octopus text uh, example, uh, though that, that API wasn't nice because of the view system things. Now we have uh, the opportunity. Now we had the opportunity to uh, just start with a clean slate and start from scratch and uh, do it the right way. Um, of course, every, uh, every one of our Octopus composables use values from Octopus theme and uh, only allow customization that are defined in Figma and the specification, but nothing more. Everything else comes from Octopus theme and everything uh, that comes from Oct Octopus theme can only be customized by the Octopus developers in Octopus theme, which is really nice. Uh, that means that developers can't mess it up. So, okay, that's nice. Um, and yeah, whenever we can, we decided to build upon the existing material components, of course, if possible, because creating everything from scratch, uh, really from scratch, is not time efficient. But if you have, for example, the button and you know how to customize it with material, you can just plug in your own stuff into the material customization options and you will end up with uh, a material button, but with your own things included. Okay, let's have a closer look at how Octopus Text looks in Compose. So, uh, of course, as you see, Octopus Text has quite a lot of customization options, but uh, these are controlled really well. Let's see the API interface of it. So, of course, uh, all the only mandatory thing here is the text. Uh, and by default, our Octopus Text is a body one type, which you could see on the previous screen and everything else is optional either, uh, even. So let's focus on these two things. These seem like that uh, they have a default value of some enum value or something. That's actually true. So text type, uh, which uh, the text type variable is actually, uh, has all of these customization options, but these are uh, hard-coded into definite enum values. So as you can see, numbers one, numbers two, those are just two examples of all the possible options that you've seen before. Um, so these have these predefined uh, things like color, line height, text size, maximum lines, so on and so forth. Uh, so these are the things that are internal to Octopus. So you can't really set these, but you can use these uh, enum values uh, as a client of Octopus. So if you call Octopus text with body one, uh, or any other uh, text type, then you, are, you can easily control how it looks like. And of course, in Figma, we have these th different text types uh, well-defined, well-lined uh, out, so everyone can know how a body one text will look like. Okay, and how we use that text type is actually, again, a really nice thing. Uh, there is this composable called Provide Textile, which is from Material, actually. And uh, the text style provided here will be used by text by default if we use the material text. So yeah, and also, as you can see, uh, the octopus theme object and composable and things that we've seen before work here, here really nicely with a uh, Kotlin construct. So we could actually just call octopus typography to get access to all of the typography uh, values inside, or all of the typography objects inside the octopus theme. And then when we get this text type of numbers one, numbers two, and so, so, so on and so forth, we can just call the appropriate mapping to the uh, theme defined um, typography. Uh, this might seem uh, a duplication of logic here because, as we've seen, the text type enums have quite a lot of settings, but now we map them to some typography things. And um, yeah, actually, this was the first uh, thing that we refactored because these, uh, these, text type con these text type enum values 
are heavily used in the view implementation. So values from there are actually extracted in the view implementation. But Compose has a much nicer uh, way to handle typography and, uh, and text-related styling settings. So we decided to just map these two, re-implement the, the enums as typography values, and eventually just phase out the, the enum part of this equation. And when we reach the bottom of the implementation of Octopus Text, we have a text call, which is the material text. We set the text. We get some uh, uh, settings still from the text type, but we will phase that out, as I said. And uh, because we have the, that provide text style at the top of the hierarchy of this composable, then everything else not set here is actually coming from the local text style dot current. For this uh, information, we had to dig a bit deep into how octo how text is implemented in Material. And we extracted that actually this is what's happening for the values we need. Local text style dot current uh, gets called. And if we provide this local text style from the outside of this text, then it will get the values from there. So that's how we actually managed to do most of our composables with material, uh, most of our components with the material components uh, involved. Uh, then just we, we just dig, uh, dug deep into the material uh, implementation and tried to figure out how we can customize those things. What we want with this is that we didn't have to re-implement everything ourselves. We just had to find those plugin points that we could use in material. OK, let's see how we've done previews, because that's a really powerful thing to do with Compose. We defined that when we were implementing things that uh, we would need at least two uh, variants of previews that we want to see. Uh, for now, of course, we will um, uh, we will broaden these. We were just experimenting. So um, yeah, we we've done separate preview annotations for dark mode, light mode, uh, and then dolphin came that sweet dolphin that enabled us to use multi-preview. So now, pretty much, we can do these previews. And uh, from Electric Eel, I guess, we, only, we, only, uh, we also have the opportunity to do different uh, device sizes and screen sizes and resize the previews and so on and so forth. So that's really nice. So this is one of our basic previews, which renders all of the, all of the components on our primary, primary background color in light mode and in dark mode. It's uh, really nice. Also, if you, have, um, if you haven't seen this before, there's a group option as well for previews. So that actually, if you're in the, uh, in the preview pane, you can switch between the defined groups, and you can see different uh, previews uh, just separated by groups. OK. So yeah, this is how we define a preview. We, pr we try to standardize it pretty much. So for every component, there must be one preview, uh, exactly one preview like this. So for Octopus Text, we have this Octopus Text preview named preview, which is annotated with our, uh, our uh, custom preview annotation. And then we just have to put uh, everything, every content that we want to display in a column, which is scrollable. That's our baseline. and. Um, then we define that we have to have a demo composable that's called in the preview. So of course, yes, so that uh, Octopus Text Compose demo. But why? The answer is that Octopus Text Compose demo is actually used in our, uh, in our Octopus demo screen as a part of the, uh, of the component demos. So of course, with this, we get this. And we also de define this Octopus Compose demo subsection composable. We just adds headers around uh, composable structures. So you might not see it, but there's numbers, titles, and so on and so forth uh, in, in our previews. And these are handled by this. So with this, um, we managed to create previews at the same time and layouts for our demo uh, module in our application. So let's see how that looks like. Um, so yeah, we already had an implementation of an in-app Octopus Design System demo that's, that is accessible from our developer options inside the application. So every developer can check how a, co a component uh, behaves in, in use. 
So yeah, it's pretty much like a big list of items. And if you click one, then you could get to screens like this, which be what we already seen. And these are actually the same as what we use in our previews. And by that, when we use it in previews, as you can see, we kept the original view-based demos, which is at the top if, if the animation scrolls up top. So that on the top, there is the view, view um, implementation. And with this setup, what we had with previews, that we separated the actual preview content from the preview uh, function itself, we can include those previews that we have in the demo as well uh, by using Compose View in these views. And let's look a bit into the future, where we actually plan to go Compose first. But of course, it's not easy, because this application is huge multiple hundreds of screens, and uh, a really, really spaghetti logic behind it. So um, it's not that easy to go all the way compose, but we will be striving for it, uh, obviously. So the first thing that we want to experiment from now on is to replace all the view implementations with, compo with the compose implementations, just to uh, ease up the maintainability of Octopus. So yeah, in this case, we would go the other way around that we discovered in the first place. Uh, we, will, we will implement wrappers around the composables to be used uh, in the views, um, yeah, which is just for maintainability purposes. Uh, but yeah, in, um, yeah, maintaining just the compose implementation and uh, handling the better way of uh, interoperability is um, yeah, just easier. Everyone would like to do that in our team. So that's nice. Also, life with minimal XML. We would, yeah, we'd like to just get rid of all of those, those shapes, those, uh, those ripple definitions, and, and everything that's uh, defined in multiple XML files all over Octopus. That would be really nice. And have everything defined in the Octopus theme and all those small classes that model our design system really well. And of course, we would want to go eventually compose only, but that's a bit uh, far-fetched for now. And uh, yeah, there are some um, big obstacles uh, before us, like uh, creating a proper view wrapper about around composables might not be worth it. Might we we might just go with uh, going pure compose by default. Uh, we don't know yet. Also, with this approach to just do custom wrap, uh, do wrappers around the composables, we will have to handle a whole plethora of things that we are used to with our views, like custom attributes and data binding, and uh, using the tooling attributes, which we can actually do, but it's not that easy. And also, we would have to redo all of our UI testing, which might not be worth it, obviously. So wrapping up. If you use the tier application, there are quite a few screens that are already full composed. And by full composed, I mean they are fragments, but the UI itself is composed. Uh, so if you click on the Get Free Rides from the menu, then you get the left screen that's full composed. And also, if you go into your wallet in the application, that, that whole flow, everything from clicking the wallet is also composed. So yeah, you might have the question, was this whole thing worth it? Was it worth re-implementing like 30 UI components and, and uh, yeah, having this interoperability thing in play and so on and so forth? And of course, with everything in software development, it depends. We had a lot of experiments. We gained a lot of experience from them. And uh, eventually, in our internal uh, in our internal like this knowledge sharing sessions, we are we are talking and presenting a lot about Compose, and uh, that's mainly uh, that's mainly because we had these experiments in the last ten months. So, actually wrapping up, if you have a design system, as you could see in the previous talk and as you could see here, having a design system is a really nice thing. And if you have a design system to convert to Compose, or, or if it's written in Compose, that's already a huge win for all of your developers, all of, the, all of your applications. 
And if you choose, uh, if you already have a view-based uh, design system, just choose a path that, uh, that fits your project, your timeline, your resources. It's not a race uh, to go compose. If, uh, if you have the time and resources and people uh, eager to do it, then just go for it. And if you're, you're like us, who are heavily invested, unfortunately, in data binding, then just consider the interoperab interoperability overhead that you might have with Compose and, uh, and Views. And also, uh, as we've done with, with the material components, just try to think of what you can reuse uh, from the Compose framework for your implementations. And of course, going from zero to hero takes a lot of time. As you can see, this whole thing that I told you in the last 30, 20, something-ish minutes, um, took like over 10 months. And we're still not finished. We're still something like there. So yeah, just uh, do, what, uh, do what your resources and timeline and, of course, PMs let you. So here are some resources that we've used uh, along the way and that you can use to start with uh, design systems and migrating to Compose and so on and so forth. And also, just for some self-promotion, uh, there was this Scotland Dev Day last Thursday that um, we were there with one of my colleagues and we've done uh, a bit more extended version of this talk, mo mostly focusing on how we redid our ar architecture for Compose. Um, so that we can have all these nice things that I've just told you about. So yeah, whenever this comes out as a video, just feel free to watch it. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you liked it. And uh, yeah, I will be here for questions afterwards. Thank you.